for your evening entertainment, the Pride of Butler, the Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band. Golden Tornado Band has represented Butler in many great events over the past 12 years, including the Rose Bowl Parade, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, the Fiesta Bowl Parade. We proudly present for your entertainment, the Pride of Butler, the Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band. Under the fifth from Richard Adams, Rock and Golden Tornado Marching Band is directed by Jeff Turner, Bob Terrenbaugh, Shannon Kelly, and Stephanie Denise. The sequel is Dance and Flight Team Directors on Sarah McCoppity and Debbie Greco. Butler, Pennsylvania, a small town 30 miles north of Pittsburgh, home to about 13,000 people and one of the most well-known high school marching bands in the country. The Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band has one of the most impressive performance resumes of any band. This impressive resume makes the band well-known internationally. While many people know where the band has been and what it has done, not many people know where this band came from and the history behind the Golden Tornado Marching Band. Believe it or not, the history of the Golden Tornado Marching Band dates back to the early 1930s. Originally, Butler High School did not want a marching band. However, the Lions Club thought it was a necessity to the school. They bought the band's first uniforms, which were made out of corduroy. With the uniforms and the approval from the school, in 1935, the first Butler Marching Band was formed for grades 10 through 12 under the direction of Joseph Squire. Only four years later, the band had a change in directors. Joseph Squire became the orchestra director, and Lola Bevington became the band director. The band also received new navy blue and gold uniforms that year. Don Gibson became the director of the marching band in 1946 after returning from World War II. During this time, the band would only participate in home football games and local parades. What you are watching now is footage of the Butler Marching Band in 1940. The Butler High Fight Song is an icon for any Butler graduate or current student. The fight song is played at every football game or other event the band is involved with. The fight song was originally written in the early 1940s by Lola Bevington. The fight song was then rearranged twice after being written with only minor changes being made. <laughs> Many high school bands have a drill team or majorettes, while the Butler Band 
used to have both. In 1960, that changed when Nancy Vlasic created the Sequinet dance team. The Butler Marching Band is the only band in the country to call their dancers Sequinets. Today, the Sequinets are well known for the high kicks that they perform. The Sequinet dance team changed directors in 1964 when Linda Garber took over. Only one year later, Karen D'Antonio became the director. The directors changed once again in 1969 when Linda Stepko became the director. In 1960, construction was completed on the new senior high school. The same high school is still used today, and the old senior high school is now known as the middle school for fifth and sixth graders. In 1964, a brand new stadium was built. Today it is known as the Art Bernardi Stadium. Rick McLean, a drum major in 1964, describes the first home game at the new stadium. The first home game the, the real game that actually was played at the stadium was either the next week or maybe uh, two weeks afterwards. I, uh, that part I don't recall. Um, at the new stadium, uh, I don't know what the capacity was in, in terms of uh, spectators at that time, but there was about 7,500 people there because it was the new stadium. And if you can imagine, I know the capacity is, is less than 7,500 today, and it was, it was much smaller, it, not much smaller, but it was smaller back then. And you imagine where 7,500 people would have parked their cars. Because at that time, there was no administration parking lot. There was no, the banana parking lot was half the size it is now. There was no intermediate school, that was the cross country track. There was no lower parking lot below the stadium on the senior high school side. I don't know where they parked, but they had a good time. It had to be standing room only times two. Um, there was just a lot of people there, and we won that game. The Butler Band changed directors in 1966 when Don Gibson retired, and Vincent Sanzotti and Raymond Schweinberg took over as the directors. Mr. Sanzotti describes the process of becoming a director of the band. I had finished my master's work at Slippery Rock in history and a man by the name of Sam DeSimone was the assistant superintendent of schools at the time and I knew him very well and he said that uh, there was an opening in the senior high school for a history teacher if I would like to apply so I did and it turns out that at the same time Don Gibson who was the band director was retiring and so <clears throat> my uh, they were going to hire a new band director which they did and the band director they hired was Ray Schweinberg and so I uh, was to work with him as a band director assistant band director uh, and teach history which is what happened in 1966 I had never met Ray Schweinberg it was we just met at the time when we started working together. And um, we, we seemed to get along okay. That worked out all right. Well, Mr. Schweinberg uh, and actually Mr. Zanzotti both grew beards during that time period. You may have heard this from some, uh, some other students that they became known. Uh, there was a cough drop company, the Smith Brothers, that uh, on their cough drops were those images of these two guys with these long beards, and they had on these... Uh, Outfits that looked very much like uh, what Mr. Schweinberg and Mr. Zanzardi wore. They wore a black uh, military band outfit with a hat, but they both had the, the, the beards. And, and so they, we became known as the Smith Brothers Band for a while there. In 1973, the Intermediate High School was open to grades 9 and 10. Along with the new school, a new marching band was formed. The new band was called the Golden Crusader Marching Band. The marching band also had its own dancers, and instead of being called sequinets, they were called the Golden Kickers. The band was formed under the direction of Harding Corky Whitaker and assisted by Jeanette Schmidt. Mr. Whitaker described how the band came to be. The Intermediate Band got started, uh, like I said, I taught seven years at the elementary, and then. Um, uh, Mr. Saw was the first principal at the intermediate, and he came to me and said, uh, you know, we're opening this new school, and uh, I want to have a band. 
So we talked, and uh, uh, we started the Intermediate High School Band in 1973. We had, I think usually we had about 100 members, and our uniform was white khakis, white turtleneck, and a navy blue blazer with insignia right here. And uh, we did all the local parades, and we did the junior high and the JV football games, which at the time, and then still, I mean, we only knew one other band in the, the whippy old that did anything like that, and that was Penn Hills. But uh, we were kind of a pioneer there with this. And then, of course, with the merger in, what year was that? Nine, around 1997 everything came together. And what was interesting was the Golden Crusader then took on the blue and white uniform colors and the high school took on the gold and white uniform colors. Um, the intermediate band wore blazers and, and just like uh, regular slack pants and we had a, a white turtleneck, um, no ha headgear at that time. And then there was a, a, a dance group which we called the Golden Kickers which is the equivalent of the high school sequinettes. And initially, I was hired that school year, 73, 74, as an elementary teacher. And um, at the intermediate was Mr. Whitaker. And he was then in charge of the intermediate high school band, uh, grades 9 and 10. And his assistant was Jeanette Schmidt. In the early 1980s, band director Raymond Schweinberg was diagnosed with cancer, and in 1984, Mr. Schweinberg passed away. Throughout the time he had cancer, he continued to work as the band director. Today, a plaque honoring him is hanging in the auditorium lobby of the senior high school. Following the death of Mr. Schweinberg, Vincent Sanzotti became the head director of the senior high Golden Tornado Marching Band. Harding Whitaker became his assistant. The intermediate band changed directors as well. Jeanette Schmidt became the head director and Andrew Yerricks was her assistant. In 1985, Karen D'Antonio once again became the sequinette director. And in 1991, Barbara Bailey became an assistant director of the intermediate band. In 1994, a big change occurred within the music department. The Intermediate Crusader Marching Band and the Butler Golden Tornado Band were combined into one Golden Tornado Marching Band. 
After combining, the band had over 375 members, making it one of the largest bands in the country. Some of the people involved in the merger of the bands, including Harding Whitaker, Andrew Yerix, and Vincent Sanzotti, describe the merger of the bands. Mr. Zanzotti had decided that he needed to replace those gold canary uniforms and was going to get new band uniforms in the early 1900s. I was department chair and we had talked at that point in time that perhaps this would be a good time to blend the bands together and go with 9 through 12 and we can buy enough uniforms then for everybody. Remember the high school band was just 11th and 12th grade and we always held our own against the bands that were 9 through 12. But uh, Mike Kelly, the, the congressman, was on the school board and he came and says, you know, why don't you guys combine? Because people were always saying, they were seeing these other bigger bands come in, why aren't we that big? Well, because it's 11th and 12th grade, you know. If we put our, put it together, it would be like in the 300s. <laughs> and uh, he came and and talked to us and said, we, why not? So the process started, we put them together, and uh, the uniforms got measured in, in the spring. We were promised the uniforms in the middle of summer, which they didn't come until, I think, about the third game of the season. I remember our, our first game with the, with the combined band was down at Penn Hills, and like I said, I did the announcing. I knew we had a big band, but whenever they started down this track, I'm looking at that, and then I see another perspective. I thought, wow, <laughs> we really are big. <laughs> and uh, always got a great response. I think the band in those days, I think we marched, we were pretty close to 350 people, sequinettes and band and everybody. Big group, a lot of fun. Uh, in the first few years, because we were combining students from both organizations, they did not want us to um, cut anybody from the program. They didn't think that would be fair, obviously. So we had like 40 golden kickers and 40 sequinettes, which meant we had 80 then, and they all were up front dancing. And the same way with the band, we didn't, couldn't cut, couldn't audition. As time went on, we were eventually able, through attrition, to dwindle the numbers down a little bit more reasonable and workable and, and then start an audition process to balance the band and balance the sequinettes and to create a flag line and a dance line. It's the structure that it is now. The first year um, we, we had to have meetings because we had two parent organizations. We had basically two fully functioning organizations and part of my job as department chair when, when this went through was to make sure that we put it all together and tied it all together. So we had meetings with not only the students, but we had meetings with the booster groups and the parents to explain. And ironically, this was the funny thing because this was in 1994, um, as I was speaking to the parent group of all the parents and, and they had their questions like what was going to happen to Susie if she's a sequinette and this one's a golden kicker, is one going to eliminate the other? No, everybody's going to be saving the positions for a few years and everything. But we talked about one of the reasons for doing it was that we could have one of the largest bands in the country. And if we do this and we have the quality that someday this band can do things like Macy's and Tournament of Roses. And I still remember to this day one adult parent stood up and made fun of me making that statement um, that day that someday this band would do Macy's and Pasadena and, and so on. He said, you're crazy, that'll never happen. I had such wonderful assistants. I mean. Mr. Whitaker, Mr. Yerricks is my assistant. Uh, Mrs. Schmidt was my assistant. Uh, I mean, all these people did fantastic work. I didn't have to do anything. Mrs. D'Antonio was in charge of the sequinettes. And I just simply took care of problems as they arose, but there weren't very many. I mean, they, uh, they, they, uh, they were very, very helpful. Mr. W Mr. Yerix took care of the percussion. Mrs. Schmidt took care of the upper woodwinds. Mr. Whitaker took care of the lower brass. And, you know, that, that was it. The newly combined band was for grades 9 through 12. The band was under the direction of Vincent Sanzotti and assisted by Barbara Bailey, Karen D'Antonio, Jeanette Schmidt, Harding Whitaker, and Andrew Yerix.
In 1997, the Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band was accepted to perform in the 1997 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. This was the band's first big televised event. Not only was the band accepted into the parade, they were chosen to be the lead band. In 1997, we were fortunate to be selected to go to Macy's. This was Mr. Zanzotti's last year. He had announced he was retiring, and I was his assistant at the high school at that point in time. And the combined band was in its third year, and things were really starting to come together. And I had said to him, you know, we ought to apply just to go to something like a Macy's and see what happens. And being it was his last year, he was going to retire. It wasn't something that he was that interested in doing, but he did give me the authority. He said, look, if you want to do this, go ahead, send in the application. We'll see what happens. But, you know, I doubt if anything will come of it. So I did put together a, a portfolio they have a very extensive application process. We put together a binder that was real thick with the history of the band, <coughs> recordings and videos. We sent it in, and lo and behold, Mr. Zanzotti got a phone call from New York saying we were selected to go to 97, and they wanted us to be the lead band because of the size of the group and the sound of the group. They wanted us to lead off the parade that year. And so that was pretty exciting. That was our first major event. And when we went up there, uh, in addition to the band going, there were nine Butler Motor Transit charter buses of parents that went to New York that year. That's amazing how many people went, on, went, went to follow us on that parade. And the Butler Eagle actually sent a reporter that spent time with us and went down the street with us and everything and did stories. And it was a big event and, and big news in the, in the city. And if you'll notice, uh, when you come down North Main Street Hill and when you go into the high school on both entrances, there is a sign that for the 97 Macy's Parade um, that we were representative, and there's also one for the 2000 Pasadena Tournament Arizona. But that's kind of the thing that kicked it all off. Mr. Zanzotti retired that year, and I was then hired to be the full band director, and then we started yearly travel after that. I think that was our first really big exposure. Every band has to go before the NBC cameras to rehearse. And since we were the lead band, we had to, our rehearsal time was 2.30 a.m. And I will never forget that because it was like uh, we went to bed at 12, and, or um, let's say 10, and then all of a sudden you're up, you're on the bus. We went down, we did, we did two run-throughs for the cameras, went around the corner, and uh, we had breakfast at the All-Star Grill, got on buses, went up to wherever it starts, I think it's called Herald Square, where it starts, and everybody sacked out on the bus for at least two hours. You could hear a pin drop. I mean, everybody was so tired. And then uh, we had the big uh, ceremony at the beginning. Some of the kids got to participate in, in the actual cutting of the ribbon that you see each time. And uh, we started down a very fast pace down to uh, where you really do the routine. And a block before that happens, it's called the quiet zone. And I always felt sorry for those people that were standing there because none of the bands played there because that was a quiet zone because they didn't want it bleeding over into their Broadway productions. And then... Uh, of course, our turn to go in, and we had a little incident there with the Radio City Rockettes. They were, in, they were doing a uh, wooden soldier routine. And you know, when you do a wooden soldier routine, it's the very, they wouldn't get out of the way. I mean, they were going like this, and we're going, you know. So we really had to run into position, which if you saw the parade this year, you know some of the bands, they're very fast paced getting into that place in front of, of Macy's and uh, did the routine. You go around the corner, you go on the buses, and you're done. But it was uh, a very neat experience, very unique. <laughs> I don't know if I'd do it again. <laughs> wow, Willard, it is big, isn't it? That is big. If you 
like Big Hitty. This is big, especially our first band. It took nine buses and a truck to get Butler, Pennsylvania's Golden Tornado Band to Brooklyn. Not surprisingly, they're today's largest musical group, and this is their first Macy's Parade, and that has to be exciting for them and us. Willard, I'm counting each one personally, but I'm told I should come up with a total of 375. Let's listen as the tornado stirs things up under the direction of Vincent Sanzotti. And uh, on the way out, that was Thanksgiving Day, of course, and on the way home, we stopped somewhere in, uh, I can't remember, I think Snyder County somewhere at a railroad station that was a restaurant, and it was just us, and they had, it was like a home-cooked meal. I mean, it was really good, and uh, made it home probably around 8 o'clock at night. In 1998, Vincent Sanzotti retired, and Andrew Yerricks took over as the head director of the marching band. At this time, Jeff Croner, Linda Granite were hired as band directors, and Stephanie Marshall was hired as the assistant sequinet director. Well, we were really excited that we got a chance. Uh, after we did Macy's, I had started actually applying for Pasadena, because you have to apply like a year and a half in advance. So. As we're applying for Pasadena and we put together this big portfolio, we wanted to do, I wanted to do something lesser expensive, a little bit smaller that next year. And so we did the Kentucky Derby in the spring, which was a nice event, uh, very cost effective for the students. In 1999, after being accepted into the Tournament of Roses Parade, the band took a smaller trip to Kentucky. And on April 20th, 1999, the band participated in the Kentucky Derby Pegasus Parade. When we got accepted to do Pasadena, we knew we were going to Kentucky Derby, so we were like in the middle of dual fundraising for two events, uh, which was kind of unique. But uh, the Tournament of Roses, really extensive application process. You have to have uh, letters of recognition from college band directors, from politicians, from local people, administrators. You have to submit video tapes of your group. Uh, <coughs> they want to know, they want pictures of every different part of your uniform. They want to see what it would look like. Size was important to them, the amount of sound, because they, they don't want, you know, when you see that on television, the camera angles, they don't want a small, tiny group coming down the street. They, they like the bigger size. Uh, it, it makes better uh, television, also the sound projection. And so when we applied uh, the first time, we were very pleased to hear the principal got a phone call and called me in and said, you know, you've been accepted, you're going to the Tournament of Roses. And then after you're excited, then you also have to realize you have to fundraise. It was going to be over a half million dollars. We were fortunate that we were able to get corporate sponsorship from the H.J. Hines Company. We put together a corporate panel of parents that worked and, and we got a lot of local contributors from the community also to help defray the cost. H.J. Hines was a top sponsor for the trip to Pasadena. They brought in the famous Hines Hitch when the Tournament of Roses president Ken Burroughs visited the band. That day the check from Hines was also presented to the band.
Heinz was one of 401 sponsors who raised $164,000 for the trip. As part of the Heinz sponsorship, the band was required to wear a Heinz patch on their uniform. We also chartered a 747 that first time, first high school to ever do that, and we had like 470 people on the plane. We had sold extra seats to parents who wanted to go on the trip with us, and <coughs> we did fly our equipment. After a lot of hard work, raising over $500,000, the band was ready to go to Pasadena. thrill of a, of a lifetime for me. I mean, uh, I'll never forget the band director at North Allegheny High School. He said, Cork, whenever you do that parade, you're going to have all kinds of emotions going through your mind whenever you make that initial pr turn, you know, that you see on TV, where they come. And he was right. Uh, that parade, we had, we had a nice, you know, it was a nice day. It wasn't raining or anything. And, uh, you made that turn and man, just all kinds of emotions go through your mind whenever you do that. The blimp was right over us and we saw the, uh, the replay and the announcer, I think it was NBC, said, look at that, look at that, that's perfect. I mean, we wor really worked on that. Uh, Barb Bailey was in charge of whipping us into shape with that turn and uh, it really, really worked out. Mr. Eriks and I went out the year before just to, you know, scope things out and they're taking us on a tour of the parade route and we're driving and we're driving and we're driving. I said, hey, where's the halfway in this plane? He says, oh, we're not there yet. I'm thinking, uh-oh, I'm going to the Y whenever I get home because, I mean, you really had to get in shape to do it. Yeah. And, and the band, too, and I, we, we uh, would practice down at the football field and I think it was 27 times around the track was the length of the parade. We did all the, all the usual tourist things. We paraded at, uh, at Disney. I think we went to Universal and uh, the Santa Monica Pier and all the good things. Great, great trip. I mean, the memory of a lifetime. This is the Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band from Butler, Pennsylvania. And here they are, 362 total members. Is that all? That's all. That's Thank enough. Too. Wow. Listen. You know, they've rehearsed for a whole year, and this is their moment of pride. I'm very proud to see them go. <laughs> All right. All right. It's nice to look see the history corners. how they got here, and then look, see them go around the corner. Watch that. Look at that band. Boy, are they holding their lines. <laughs> You picked Beautiful. the right one to feature. Well, it took a year for them to get ready because they knew they were going to be spotlighted by us. So there well, they are. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have to watch their diagonals, too. Well, so that's what we're looking at. Yeah. There they are. Look at that. Straight as a line, man. In 2000, the band traveled to Toronto to perform in the Santa Claus Parade. 
Harding Whitaker and Karen D'Antonio retired following the season. Stephanie Marshall became the head sequinet director and Jill Mayer was hired as her assistant. At the end of December 2001, the band traveled to Florida to participate in the Orlando Citrus Bowl Parade on December 29th and the Disney World Holiday Parade on December 30th. Yeah, the Citrus Bowl is part of the, the national football game every year, um, right around the New Year's Day. And that was another event that we didn't have to apply for. We got invited to come to. And it's in Orlando. The parade is before the, um, the football game and two university bands are there. A lot of high school bands go to it. Um, it's a couple mile long parade. Um, when we were there the one year, Michigan State was there and I don't remember who the other college band was, but uh, we did it twice. Um, very nice parade. They have a, a reviewing stand, national television, all that, like a lot of those. Not as big as like the Fiesta Bowl or Pasadena, but uh, still a pretty big uh, event and, and nice televised event. And when we did that, we also did Universal Studios and Disney, Disney World, and we performed at Disney World when we were there both times. In 2002, the band returned to New York City to participate in Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade for the second time. The second time we went was right after the World Trade Center collapses. Um, and we weren't even sure we were going to be able to go that November because of what had happened and that there was still a lot of concern about terrorism in the country and especially New York as being a, a target city again. Uh, and I know there were a lot of internal meetings with school board people and so on, and we decided that, that we could go ahead and do the trip. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do, though, was because it was such a historic event in our country, uh, we wanted to make sure we did take the students to see that area. And so part of our, our day, we, we took them to Staten Island and got on the Staten Island Ferry, which heads straight into the, the point of Lower Manhattan. We got off the ferry and we walked in through Battery Park, which is there, and they had the globe that was crushed from outside the World Trade Center on display there. We saw that and then we walked up um, the streets up to Ground Zero and we walked the same route that, that you see famously on TV where you see all the smoke coming down. And um, we got to Ground Zero and it was dead silence. Uh, there was no traffic around that area because they was, you know, all roped off. But people, you don't hear the typical New York noise there. It was dead silence. Um, the pit was there and you could see um, where the buildings used to be and some of the rubble yet they were finishing up, cleaning up. And, and then on the fences across the street were still all the pictures of people who were lost people were saying I'm looking for my uncle I'm looking for so and so I'm, you know and so the kids got to see all of that they were crying as they're watching this which was really amazing to see high school kids so touched by this we went to the <coughs> Trinity Church where a lot of the volunteers had slept and worked uh, to, to clear up the tower area and ironically the first time we were there in 97 was right after the um, garages underneath the World Trade Center had been a had a terrorist attack and were bombed and we actually parked our coaches outside and I know we were talking to the students saying this is the famous World Trade Center and the uh, parking garages had been bombed and they're currently rebuilding those now. Uh, little did we know a few years later we'd be back and the buildings would be gone but that was the biggest difference. Um, the event is very similar I mean it, it's one of the the coolest New Year's events when when you march down that parade route you will see people uh, and the skyscrapers, um, looking out the windows, if there's decks or uh, observation decks, there's people everywhere. Their people are like 15 deep along the parade route. Now, the big thing that people don't realize, the second time we went after 9-11, 
they had had meetings with all the band directors uh, and uh, about Homeland Security and, and things that they had in place because they figured a parade would be a target. Somebody could do something. And they instructed us. Our kids all had a special thing they had to wear. Uh, all our chaperones had a special thing. They had. You could not be on the street unless you had that on. Uh, police were like almost every 10 steps along with, with uh, dogs. And a lot of people don't know, they actually weld the manhole cover shut on the parade route so nobody could attack through those. Um, they have snipers on the buildings. Uh, it's amazing the things you don't know that they were telling us behind the scenes the second time. Please feel safe. Make sure you tell your kids, you know, and, and if something should happen, this is what you do. This is how you, how you maneuver, how you pull the kids together and where you head if there is something that happens during the parade. But nothing happened. Uh, but they, it's amazing that after that event, not only there, but Tournament of Roses, all the major events put in all of these special um, precautions and work with Homeland Security because they would be wonderful targets for a terrorist on national TV to do something foolish. And so as much as you don't want to think about it, they do and they instruct you on what to do and not to do. that was a big deal. I remember parents being a little afraid. I remember my parents personally being very afraid to send me and actually thinking about not sending me on the trip because of that. Um, they took us to Ground Zero and they were actually still cleaning up the wreckage from the attack. So we were there, got to see um, the famous cross that stuck out of the ground. We got to see all of the construction and then we eventually went on to do the actual Macy's Parade, which was phenomenal. I remember them saying, whether it's true or not, that it was one of the coldest Macy's Parades on record. And I remember we didn't have anything to keep us warm. And one band had these foil blankets and they walked by us and they were tearing them off and wrapping our hands in them because we were so cold. And our featured twirler, the Golden Girl, um, Summer Criley was her name. She actually was on the verge of hypothermia and they had to carry her, one of the wrestlers, famous WWE wrestlers, I don't know which one it was, that was in front of us in the parade, had to carry her into their wrestling truck and warm her up before we went out on, onto the route. But it was cool, you stood there forever on the side of the road and then eventually they said, okay, it's time to go and we just, pretty much ran onto the street, ran into our lineup and took off. And then I think it was, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, two and a half miles later, we were done. But it was the most incredible parade experience of my life. Butler, Pennsylvania's Golden Tornado Marching Band is not only the biggest in today's parade, they're one of the largest high school bands in the country. How big? Well, once they chartered their own Boeing 747 aircraft. That's big. For today's big event, however, this supersized show band rolls into New York on nine buses. They're all accounted for and ready to wail on their return trip to Macy's Parade. The 340 members of the Golden Tornado Band, under the direction of Andrew Yaxer, all rocking the paradise.
2003, the band traveled to Philadelphia to perform in their Thanksgiving Day Parade. Philadelphia was one of the years where I wanted to do, as I said before, big, small, big, small, as far as expenditures for the students, and we needed a smaller event. We had never done the Philadelphia Thanksgiving Day Parade. It's one of the oldest parades in the country, uh, and it does, uh, it's a big televised parade. And the other impetus was uh, Dr. Fink, our superintendent, is a Philadelphia native, and his family is still there. So <clears throat> he was elated when we decided to do this event. And um, it was a nice, nice parade. Um, we saw, uh, if you saw the movie Rocky, where he runs up the steps of the art museum, that's where the parade ends and where television is, and it's a, it's a great backdrop for the parade. Um, it's a couple mile long parade and is a nice, the, the ending of it's a nice straight long big boulevard that goes into that turn in television. We did it twice also and mainly because it was economical for us to do. Uh, it didn't take a lot of days to do and the, the year after that was always going to be something that was going to be a little bit more aggressive financially for the students. Fiesta Bowl in Arizona was, is a major trip. Um, we have to fly out there. We had to truck our equipment out there. And we did it twice. And both times we, uh, we did the event. Um, it's for the college games again. The first year Pitt uh, was in the football game against Utah. And I don't recall who was there the second year. But you always see a couple of great college marching bands, a lot of high school bands involved in that. Again, it has the national television, the big... Uh, television area with grandstand seating. Uh, pretty long parade overall, about maybe three miles for that one. But the nice thing about that is there's so much to do out there. We took the students to the Grand Canyon. We went up to Williamsburg and got on the rails to the rim train both times and did the Grand Canyon, which was a neat experience for them. We did Sedona, which is Red Rock Country. We did uh, Old Town Scottsdale. Uh, the Fiesta Bowl holds a, an event for all the bands um, in an in old west town called Rawhide, which is just like a replica of walking back in time, and they do a big steak fry there. It's a really big area that um, you can have a lot of fun with. So there was a lot of opportunity for some great uh, sightseeing. We did Montezuma's Castle when we were there, which is built into the side of a hill. Um, the scenery, it's, it's the, the southwest is so much different. Uh, that was one of the comments a lot of the students made is they'd never seen anything like this before. Um, the cactus and all the other stuff, it, it's just a different look than what we're used to when you look outside the window here. But th those were both great events uh, and we flew to both of them and trucked our equipment to both of those also. Paramedic, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some really, really, or as Ed Sullivan, you say, really big bands. Of course, really the kids big. at home are going, who's Ed Sullivan? But anyway, in the parade today, they march with 333 members, which makes them one of the largest in the, in the U.S. They are so big, Patty. This would be when you say, how big are they, Mike? How big are they, Mike? They are so big, they have their own zip code. No, I made that up. They are so big that they, had, they did have to charter three planes to get here. Would you welcome the Golden Tornado Marching Band from Butler High School in Butler, Pennsylvania. In 2005, the band received new uniforms. Also, the band returned to Toronto for a second time to perform in their Santa Claus Parade. The boldest bands in North America, it's the Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band from Butler, Pennsylvania. And with over 300 members in their ranks, they are taking this city by storm. Welcome to the Santa Claus Parade, guys. Girls.
The band took another big trip to California for the second time. On January 1st, 2007, the band performed in the 118th Pasadena Tournament of Roses Parade. I think everything's easier the second time around. Once you know what you're dealing with, when you know the locale, when you know the locations. Like one of the things we did, the Tournament of Roses is the longest parade you'll ever march, five and a half miles, and by the time you get to the end, it's over six. We actually had to prep both times, practice marching. We had to do exercises with the students, build up their stamina, um, weightlifting, all kind of stuff. Um, we did a practice march both times of six miles to make sure they could do it uh, and perform and be ready for that. And one of the things we did the second time around was that we actually drove the students through the parade route the day before uh, so they could see what you know what it looks like this is this is where you're going to be going and you'll know when you see the Pasadena City College you're only halfway through the parade and when you get to here you're going to go underneath this bridge you're almost at the end and when you run around here is Victory Park this is where so we actually made sure we drove the buses and everybody and we narrated a trip we narrated the whole parade for them the second time well Pasadena was a big deal I was there twice in 2000 and in 2007 and it's a six mile long parade and it's very grueling. So we really practiced a lot. We practiced in front of the ad building. Um, they would mark off where we had to do that large turn and we practiced and practiced that so that our lines would be correct and everything was good. And we marched through the banana. We even marched at community college. We practiced at community college. And if there was a day that it was um, bad weather, we would practice here in the auditorium and we would um, march up and down the aisles. The, the dance team and flaggers would be on stage and we put in a lot of time. And then when we got to Pasadena, we also rehearsed there. We would go out into the parking lots and rehearse several times before the parade. And I think both times we accomplished it very well because the band looked wonderful. <laughs> Stephanie proudly down Colorado Boulevard as the Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band from Butler, Pennsylvania. Over 300 members strong, the Golden Tornado Band has established itself as one of the top programs in the country. The group's impressive list of national performances includes appearances in NBC's Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, the Fiesta Bowl Parade, and of course our Rose Parade. And I would say they look very stylish in their navy gold and white uniforms. Total precision. Blister protection on their feet. I think so. <laughs> it's sold out. The and they never bump into each other. I love that. I know. How do they do that with those big drums in front of them? They can't see each other. See a pretty girl in the audience, it's like, whoa. <laughs> but it never happens. They're focused. Excellent, excellent. Later that year, the band took a smaller trip to New York City to perform in the Nation's Day Parade on November 11th. The band returned to Orlando in December 2008 to perform in the Disney World Spectro Magic Parade and the Orlando Citrus Parade. In 2009, the band returned to Philadelphia for their annual Thanksgiving Day Parade.
band took another big trip in 2010 when they flew to Arizona to once again perform in the Fort McDowell Fiesta Bowl Parade. and went on a new trip in 2011. They traveled to Chicago to perform in the McDonald's Thanksgiving Day Parade. My last trip, I wanted to do something different. We'd done everything twice, with the exception of the Kentucky Derby, and that was in the spring, but this was my last year. I knew I was gonna retire at the end of the year. And again, I wanted to do something that was fairly economical and someplace we'd never been before. So <coughs> we found out about the Chicago Thanksgiving Day Parade. And again, that was one where we didn't have a problem getting in. And um, Chicago was just a, a whole different scenario for us. Uh, we did the Navy Pier area. Um, we did the uh, tournament, uh, the uh, medieval times when we were there. Uh, and we did uh, sightseeing of downtown Chicago. We did a lot of that. And there was actually a big, uh, one of the largest Christmas festivals in the world is in Chicago. We took them to that. Um, and we did the parade. The parade was a nice event. Sheridan Chicago Hotel and Towers present the Butler Golden Tornado Marching Band from Butler, Pennsylvania, about 30 miles north of Pittsburgh. 290 members. Wow. That's a big crew there. They're one of the largest high school marching bands in the country. This one's going to go on for a while. Yeah, Let's good. listen in here. Their motto, as you watch them, is pride, tradition, and excellence. My mottos as well. Uh -huh. Something to strive for. Mm -hmm. wow. Look at that. Most high schools aren't even that big. In 2012, the band changed directors for the first time since 1998. Andrew Yerricks retired and Jeff Kroner took over as the head director. Along with this change, Mr. Kroner hired Todd Karenbauer, Shanna Kelly, Courtney Cristoforetti, and Sarah McClafferty. That year, the band traveled to Orlando to perform at Disney World. Uh, I found a whole new respect for Mr. Yerricks and anyone that is a head director of a marching band. The time involved is just truly amazing. It's worth it because the end result and the memories that are being built for the students here uh, just are something that you'll take for a lifetime with you. But it is um, just an incredible amount of time. You know, as we're right now in May, we've already got next season planned. We're looking at the following season. It's just something you have to just be very proactive with. Uh, but with that, I find that my pride has also increased being the head director because I have even a little bit more ownership than I did when I was an assistant. In 2013, Courtney Cristoforetti left on maternity and Stephanie Denis was hired along with Emmelyn Wazaleski. The band also returned to Toronto that year. The band traveled to Stamford, Connecticut for the first time in 2014 to participate in the UBS Parade Spectacular. In 2015, the band returned to Chicago to once again perform in the McDonald's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Emmeline Wazaleski left the band in 2016 on maternity and Debbie Greco was hired. The band also traveled to Orlando, Florida to participate in the Disney World Holiday Parade. The band performed in the Toronto Santa Claus Parade for the fourth time in 2017. In 2018, the band traveled to Norfolk, Virginia for the first time to perform in the Grand Illuminations Parade. 
Butler, the Butler High School Golden Tornadoes. That's who you see behind us right now. They join us all the way from Pennsylvania. Wow. Happy to welcome them to Norfolk for the Grand Illumination Parade. And, you know, we are so honored to have them here because they performed in the Macy's Day Parade, the Rose Bowl Parade, the New York Nations Day Parade, and many more. Let's take a look. In 2019, the band received new uniforms. Stephanie Denis left on maternity and Lou Croner became an assistant director. Many awards have been created over the years for different reasons. The band has three awards memorializing three students that passed away during their time with the band. Paul Kelly Award, the Shelley Portman Award, and the Carrie Connor Award. Each of these awards are given to students in the band that represent the spirit of those students. Some traditions that the band has had for many years include the band festival, pie festival, alumni night, and senior night. For alumni night, former band members get to go on the football field and perform pregame with the band. 2018, Shanna Kelly changed alumni night and all of the former drum majors of the band can conduct pregame. Senior night is an event that all band members simultaneously look forward to and also dread. It's a goodbye of sorts for the seniors. Emotions are always high as the bagpipes begin to play Amazing Grace. The season is ended with an Irish blessing and the release of the seniors' golden balloons. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. The sun shine warm upon your face. The rain fall short upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand.
I'm Anna Kaufman. I'm Logan Kirkwood. And I'm Ashley Court. And we were the drum majors for the 2018-2019 band season. 2019 marks the 25th anniversary of the bands combining. We hope that you have enjoyed the documentary that we have put together, hoping to showcase the history of the Butler High School Marching Band. It has been an honor to do this, and we want to thank everyone that has supported it and also participated in it.